everybody and welcome to Lockdown Poetry. Today we're going to be looking at two different poems, Sonnet 29 by Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Climbing My Grandfather by Andrew Waterhouse. Let's go! Let's get started with our first poem, Sonnet 29 by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. I think of thee, my thoughts do twine and bird about thee as wild vines about a tree, put out broad leaves, and soon there's naught to see except the straggling green which hides the wood. Yet, oh, my palm tree, be it understood, I will not have my thoughts instead of thee who art dearer, better. Rather, instantly renew thy presence as a strong tree should. Rustle thy boughs and set thy trunk all bare. And let these bands of greenery which ensphere thee drop heavily down, burst, shattered everywhere. Because in this deep joy to see and hear thee and breathe within thy shadow a new air, I do not think of thee. I am too near thee. What is this poem about? Well, it's about love. How can we tell that? The poem starts with the line, I think of thee which shows us that the speaker is talking about somebody close to them. We know it's someone that they love because this poem is a sonnet. A sonnet is a specific kind of poem which has 14 lines and follows a certain metre and a certain rhyme scheme. Most importantly, sonnets are traditionally love poems. What happens in this poem? Let's go through it line by line. The speaker is thinking about the person that they love and they start to use a metaphor to show us how they think about them. A metaphor is a kind of imagery that tells us that something is something else to help us to understand it better. In this case, the speaker says that my thoughts do twine and bird about thee as wild vines about a tree. They tell us their thoughts wrap around this person in the way that vines wrap around a tree. What can this tell us about their relationship? Well, it could tell us many things. It could tell us that the tree and the vine, the lovers, have a symbiotic relationship and that they need each other to survive. It could mean that the vine, the speaker's thoughts, is like a parasite and is sucking the life out of the tree, the person that they love. Maybe the vine, the speaker's thoughts, is protecting the tree. Let's see if there are more clues in the poem that can help us to understand this relationship. The vines put out broad leaves, suggesting the idea of growth and new life. This also connects to the word bud that we see back in the first line. What can this tell us about their relationship? Maybe it's young and it's growing. However, things soon begin to feel a bit more ominous when we are told that soon there's naught to see except the straggling green which hides the wood. If we remember that the vines, the straggling green, symbolise the speaker's thoughts, what does this tell us about the relationship? Perhaps the thoughts have grown out of control and are overshadowing the relationship itself. In terms of the metaphor, we cannot see the tree anymore. So the speaker's thoughts about the person that they love have become far more significant than the actual person. The speaker carries on the metaphor, calling their lover, oh, my palm tree. They do not want to be limited to the thoughts of the person they love, when seeing them in person would be so much better. The speaker uses strong, powerful, imperative language here. It sounds like they are refusing to be satisfied with just their own thoughts. They will see their lover. Rather, the speaker suggests that their lover should renew thy presence and appear in person. They use flattery, suggesting that their lover should behave as a strong tree should, by shaking off these constraining thoughts and appearing in person. The vines are now not just symbolising the speaker's thoughts. They are bands of greenery which ensphere thee. They no longer seem to show hope, growth, new life. Instead, they feel more like chains or manacles. They have become restrictive to this relationship. The poem celebrates the lover, the tree, 
shaking off these overpowering thoughts in order to appear in person. The line ends with the three strong words, burst, shattered, everywhere. In listing them like this, each word gets a strong emphasis, showing us how important this is to the speaker. It creates a really forceful, passionate tone. And what happens at the end? The speaker talks about being reunited with their lover and drops the metaphor. They do not need this imagery and figurative language any longer, since their lover is there in person and no longer restricted to their thoughts. The speaker can see their lover, hear them, breathe the same air as them, and so they no longer think about them. They do not need to think about them any longer because they are together. Let's read through the poem one more time, looking at this imagery. I think of thee. My thoughts do twine and bird about thee as wild vines about a tree. Put out broad leaves, and soon there's naught to see except the straggling green which hides the wood. Yet, oh my palm tree, be it understood, I will not have my thoughts instead of thee who art dearer, better. Rather, instantly renew thy presence, as a strong tree should. Rustle thy boughs and set thy trunk all bare, and let these bands of greenery which ensphere thee drop heavily down, burst, shattered, everywhere. Because, in this deep joy to see and hear thee, and breathe within thy shadow a new air, I do not think of thee, I am too near thee. Pause the video here and have a go at creating your own piece of art to illustrate the extended metaphor in this poem. You could draw, paint, build a sculpture or even use your own body. Don't forget to take a photo of your work and share it on social media tagging at Curve Lester. And we'll be back in a minute to have a look at another poem. On to our second poem, Climbing My Grandfather by Andrew Waterhouse. I decide to do it free, without a rope or net. First, the old brogues, dusty and cracked. An easy scramble onto his trousers, pushing into the weave, trying to get a grip. By the overhanging shirt, I change direction, traverse along his belt to an earth-stained hand. The nails are splintered and give good purchase. The skin of his finger is smooth and thick, like warm ice. On his arm, I discover the glassy ridge of a scar, 
place my feet gently in the old stitches and move on. At his still firm shoulder, I rest for a while in the shade, not looking down, for climbing has its dangers, then pull myself up the loose skin of his neck to a smiling mouth to drink amongst teeth. Refreshed, I cross the screed cheek to stare into his brown eyes, watch a pupil slowly open and close. Then up over the forehead, the wrinkles well spaced and easy to his thick hair, soft and white at this altitude. Reaching for the summit, where, gasping for breath, I can only lie watching clouds and birds circle, feeling his heat, knowing the slow pulse of his good heart. This poem, Climbing My Grandfather, shows the speaker thinking back to his childhood and viewing climbing his grandfather like climbing a mountain. Maybe it suggests that, as a child, the speaker viewed his grandfather like a tall mountain. He uses an extended metaphor throughout the poem, comparing this kindly old man to a ragged mountain. The speaker clearly loves his grandfather. How can we tell that? Well, the big clue lies in all of this specific language he's using to discuss mountaineering. We know that the speaker clearly knows a lot about mountaineering since he uses such technical language as traverse, screed, altitude. So from that, we can make an educated guess that mountaineering is probably something he really enjoys as an adult. In the first line, he tells us that he wants to climb free without a rope or net. Free climbing like this can be dangerous. So the speaker is suggesting that the process of remembering could also be risky. Maybe he'll uncover sad memories as well as happy ones. Using the metaphor of an activity he loves to recall these memories of his grandfather tells us that he really was very fond of him. This climbing metaphor really helps the speaker to uncover and remember some really specific and detailed memories of his grandfather. As he starts at the bottom, looking at his grandfather's old brogues and trousers, we get the impression of a towering adult being viewed from below by a young child. This helps us as a reader get to know the grandfather from the speaker's own perspective. He actively has to climb up his body to get to see his face. The things that the speaker uncovers about his grandfather during this journey are really, really detailed. Like these are the kind of details that only somebody who knew him really intimately would have encountered. He remembers his grandfather's overhanging shirt and his earth-stained palms. These are really clear visual descriptions of what the old man looked like, which allows us, as a reader, to really build a detailed image in our heads. What kind of imagery from this poem stands out the most to you? However, what you might notice is that a lot of these details are external, It's stuff that we can see. How do we know this? Well, the poet uses words like dusty and cracked and splintered. The picture of this grandfather is obviously incredibly detailed, especially because the poet is using both visual and tactile language, things we can see and things we can feel. But we don't get any sense of his personality. What could this tell us about the speaker's relationship to his grandfather? Maybe he never knew him very well, or maybe the grandfather died when the speaker was quite young. The poem also carries a tinge of sadness. Can you spot it? While he is metaphorically climbing up, the speaker tells us that he is not looking down, for climbing has its dangers. Again, He is using the metaphor of climbing, but this time he uses it to explore the difficult process of remembering someone. These dangers could symbolise the sometimes upsetting process of trying to remember somebody who has died. Let's finish up this poem by taking a look at its structure. As you can see, it's quite freely written, 
There's no obvious rhythm or rhyme scheme. Take a moment to think about the punctuation at the end of the lines. Sometimes there's a punctuation mark, like a full stop or a comma. But mostly, the sentences continue to run on into the next line. This means that when we read through the poem, we don't end up getting stuck in a particular rhythm. Instead, we can just meander through it on a journey that feels quite like the speaker's own climbing journey. The poet is using the structure of the poem to explore this climbing metaphor even further. So bearing all that in mind, let's read the poem through one more time. Climbing my grandfather. I decide to do it free, without a rope or net. First, the old brogues, dusty and cracked. An easy scramble onto his trousers, pushing into the weave, trying to get a grip. By the overhanging shirt, I change direction, traverse along his belt to an earth-stained hand. The nails are splintered and give good purchase, and the skin of his finger is smooth and thick, like warm ice. On his arm, I discover the glassy ridge of a scar, place my feet gently in the old stitches, and move on. At his still firm shoulder, I rest for a while in the shade, not looking down, for climbing has its dangers, then pull myself up the loose skin of his neck to a smiling mouth to drink among teeth. Refreshed, I cross the screed cheek to stare into his brown eyes, watch a pupil slowly open and close. Then up over the forehead, the wrinkles well spaced and easy to his thick hair, soft and white at this altitude. Reaching for the summit, where, gasping for breath, I can only lie watching clouds and birds circle, feeling his heat, knowing the slow pulse of his good heart. OK, so now it's your turn. Pause the video here and have a go at writing your own version of this poem. You could write about anyone you know, a friend, a parent, a grandparent. You can talk about climbing, like Andrew Waterhouse does, or any other activity you like. Don't forget to share your poetry on social media and tag us so that we can see it, at Curve Lester. Thanks so much for joining us for Lockdown Poetry. Don't forget to share your work online so that we can see it by tagging at Curve Lester on social media. Bye.